Hello, Hello and listeners. welcome. <laughs> what? What? Sorry, I was. <clears throat> you wanted to say something? I was about to, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. But obviously you were about to as well. No, it's not important. I just was going to say hello and welcome to the Alien Familiar podcast, but I just, uh, I usually do, but if you want to this time, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> Hello and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG podcast. I am Clayton. I'm Nina. I'm a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> Named KP. I'm Jordan. And before we get started, I just want to remind our listeners that you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. We can you can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash alienfamiliar. I am on Discord as DM Scorpio number 0660, and I've got a channel specifically for Alien Familiar Media. And we have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash alienfamiliarmedia. If you want, to, if you enjoy our content and you would like to help us out with hosting costs, any help that you would be able to offer would be greatly appreciated. If you want more like left ear, right ear ASMR content with Clayton and I reading the same sentence at the same time, slightly delayed, check out our Patreon. It's, it's on there. Is it on there? It can be, it can be on there. I think that's going to be a very, very high tier um, reward. I thought so too. I'm offended that I wasn't chosen for the ASMR like perk. <laughs> you don't have to have like a hot female voice to do ASMR. You could talk like this. People are into that. Are you saying I don't have a hot male voice? Yeah. What are you, you just, saying, you're just, Nina? Like, no, you're offending your friends left and right. <laughs> this is what you just did. I'm just drinking water from a Powerade bottle. That's my life. <laughs> so. So today we're going to be tra- talking about keeping things fresh and interesting, specifically campaigns. Good at that. I suggest bringing ASMR into your campaigns. <laughs> fresh and interesting. We're going to be hitting it from two different sides. <laughs> <laughs> the player side and the GM side. So I guess we're going to start off with the player side like we normally do whenever we break things up down like this. Maybe they're new. Maybe they're new to this. They don't know. Now they know. Well, if you're new, thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah. You're my favorite. (laughs) Okay. All right. So, from the player's perspective, you can increase the knowledge of your character. Um, Your, or I'm sorry, you can increase what you know about your character. This can be creating additional backstory for the character, or if the campaign has run long enough, like... I don't know, like maybe three or four sessions or more, then you can go back and revisit your character sheet because there are absolutely cer- uh, certainly things that you have forgotten about your character's backstory that might become a relevant plot point that you might want to um, bring up at some point or have your game master um, be made aware of again so that maybe the game master be- might be able to bring um, an aspect of your character into the game itself. Maybe you um, forgot about that shaved owlbear tattoo you said your character has. It's been four sessions. Whip that puppy out. Give it some sunlight. Show the world. Be proud. Yeah, but by then it's all faded, and you can't really tell that it's an owlbear anymore. It kind of looks like a like a fat guy. <laughs> like a naked fat guy blob. <laughs> How would you shave an owlbear? How or why? How? Um, but also why? The why is a person. Um, <laughs> you can definitely use some kind of Wouldn't like you sleeping sleep spell. Wouldn't you pluck a owl bear? Oh, they are feathered. Mm. Mm. I thought they were kind of feathered and haired, furred. Furred. Mm. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. A pl- plucked owl bear. God, Kentucky Fried owl bear. All right. Oops. Three minutes and we're already off track. <laughs> pluck an owl owl bear. Hold a man. <laughs> Well, we didn't get a good cold opening, so this is it. <laughs> Three minutes into the episode, you're getting a cold opening. I'm warm now. <laughs> I always forget about backstory stuff, though. Like, I'll write it down, and I, I literally will just forget about it and not look back at it. Especially with the big questionnaires that you tend to give us. There's lots of times I've answered stuff that's like, oh, fuck, I care about that. <laughs> <laughs> Ten questions is big, huh? <laughs> You've given much bigger ones. I have than that given before. much bigger in the past, yeah, but I've, I've trimmed it down to ten questions. I have seen multi page questionnaires from you many yes. times. Yes. I admit that that is a problem that I have. <laughs> but hopefully I've rectified it. Do you feel that the questionnaires are currently too long? No. Okay. I think it's just enough freezer space. You got ten questions, you answer them, 
You put that in the freezer. Your freezer is not too full. You get bored. You got to spice it up. Thaw out one of those questions. Defrost that puppy. So related to adding more things to the backstory or just more fleshing out your character, thinking about your character or the campaign is a way of keeping things fresh. If you're a player, like in between sessions, talk about the game or your character, what you want with the game master, or even just talk about it with another player. Kyle, I know that I know from stories that you and KD talk about what's going on in the campaigns in between sessions, considering you're around each other all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, We're actually Siamese twins, and so we talk about it constantly. But I think it's a great way to keep things alive, though. Um, there would be many times I'll be sitting here having a fine conversation with a, 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 an intelligent friend about books and such, and then, uh, you know, reading Tolstoy, and then in comes Kyle, and he's just like, I want to talk about the campaign. And I, I, I humor him. I humor the boy. And then we come to conclusions, and we conspire, and in the next session, we show up with a plan together. Imagine that. Two people with a plan to do something. Very cool. Keeps it fresh. And doing new things in a campaign is absolutely a way to keep it fresh. If, like, whether you collaborate or not, um, bringing in something that you haven't either explored yet or just... I know most game masters would hate this, just coming in and just tearing the game off of any idea of a path that the game master might have had in their mind. Going out and just finding something new in the world to engage in finding some new activity that your character can do. Like, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons has a really good um, section in in its core books about specific downtime activities that your character can engage in, like crafting or researching specific information, um, going to town and sowing rumors or trying to pick up rumors. It usually just involves a single die roll, but it's a lot of really great flavor that adds to the campaign and makes the campaign world itself richer and also helps to make your character richer as well. I think that level of new thing to introduce, all the examples you just gave, is a lot easier to uh, introduce and probably a lot less heart attack causing for the DM than to Legit, and I was joking about Kyle and I conspiring, although we do make plans, but to actually, with another player, conspire to do something extremely out of the ordinary, extremely unrelated to what you're doing, and to bring that in and think, yeah, we're going to do this new thing, we're going to spice it up. It's like, you you don't spring butt stuff on somebody. You talk about it first, you know? My analogies are really good, actually. If you, if you, if you break them down... That's like, one opinion out of four. <laughs> I do like that you have to break down your analogies for them to be good. Like, you don't know. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's what you said, though. Our, our listeners break them down all the time. They're smarter than any of us. It's like a good joke. The more ex- you explain it, the better it gets. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love that what we've been talking about um, for players to do to spice up a campaign is exactly how you move along in, um, like how you progress the game in a quiet year, which is like a a world building board game. And like one of the things you do each of your turn is like start a discussion, discover something new, start a project. And I just think it's really funny that, um, like that's essentially what we're telling the players to do in your game. Like just hold those action cards with you from a quiet year. Every time you play an RPG. Well, now I need really do need to play that game because I, I've never played Quiet Year. Okay, it's so good. Like next time Haley's free, we should just all get together and play it because I love that game. I think throwing in downtime mini game kind of things is pretty cool. You've done that a couple times, haven't you? Like somebody got something stolen from them, and like you know, a few people came out on top. Other people got totally screwed over, and then it's like you get back to the main line of the game. It's like, well, shit, we got this, this, and that that we got to deal with now. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yeah, in the uh, in our Bana game where we were doing the after adventure draws mm-hmm. from the cards and then yeah. consulting that chain that um, that chart from the um, Savage Worlds Beasts and Barbarians campaign setting, that really helped make everybody interested in what was going on because there were things that, like in the real world, there were things that were happening to your characters that you had no control over and you were just forced to deal with it, and it was. Mm-hmm usually a really minor thing, mm-hmm. but it was still something that you just had to 
figure out what in character what you would do in that situation. And then it just reinforced who the characters were and also helped to give an avenue for um, some sort of growth or change in the character. And finding ways of growing and changing is another way of keeping the campaign fresh. Like, um, like no character is in a game or in a novel or in real life. Nobody is the same from the first thing that they do until like years or adventures worth of other things come and happen and impact their lives. People change. So um, another way of keeping the campaign fresh would be looking back at the original things that you had intended for your character and thinking about how the events of the campaign might have changed your character in some way. Um, maybe it has made your character a little bit more cynical. Maybe you've had a whole bunch of shit go down and you were originally a very optimistic character and just you come to the realization that after, in D&D terms, after 12 levels of being this wide-eyed, um, naive person, it's time for you to have a little bit of world weariness. There's only so many times that somebody can come up and um, trick you with there's only so many times um, a villager can come up and try to um, entice Here's you into doing a, a, a heroic act hey, and then get... Hey, I got a free hot dog here! Free hot dog! Somebody go kill the dragon! Yep. There's only so many times you can do that before it starts to get stale. Three times. The hot dogs will get stale if they aren't, they aren't eaten. I, even if it's something that isn't, like, a completion of an arc, like you've slain the dragon. It could be one of those mini things we were talking about where you introduce, um, you know, hey, you get pickpocketed and your, like, somewhat important but not game-breaking item gets stolen. Tracking that down takes, like, a third of a session, you get it back. It was just a little blip that you, the GM, introduced to make things interesting. Even something like that would have an effect on your character. Like, I think it's a great idea to look back over 12 levels of D&D &D and think about all of the massive enemies you've slain and the lands you've conquered and the castles you hold and whatnot... And of course you're going to be changed after that. But the first time a homeless man stole my iPod, that changed me. And that was just a minor thing. Now you just knife him on sight. Uh, no, uh, I, I actually, every single homeless person I encounter, this was in San Francisco, mind you, mm. every homeless person I encounter, I shake them down and try to take their iPods. Ah. Could be mine. They're know. stolen anyway. They look the same to me, homeless people. That was a lot. They're the same. They're sad members of humanity that we've abandoned, and they steal iPods. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have noticed, but the last... Well, we haven't really played that many long campaigns but um, since then. But um, something that I've started doing with my characters mm -hmm. is at the start, the character is never killed. And as the game progresses and the body count rises, I start incorporating that into the character. Like, the weight of all of those lives <laughs> weighing down on them changes you. Sometimes it, very often, like my, my example of making it cynical, very often that's what happens. Or you start to become a little bit sociopathic. Um, these are things that most characters just, it's not something that comes into the character. Mm -hmm. But if this were happening in the real world, yeah, you'd be having nightmares. You'd be having things, you'd be having post-traumatic stress. Um, that's a thing I've considered incorporating into the Apocalyptia character sheet is like a kill count. But if you just see that without any other context, uh, it looks like it's encouraging you to <laughs> rack up a kill count. <laughs> but for the exact reasons mm -hmm. you're talking about, like hmm. 30 fucking people's blood on my hands. You well, know? It's, it's XP from Undertale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What if you put um, a little you know small print thing beneath the psyche meter that just was a reminder to be like, your first kill, the first time you see a weird enemy... Stuff like this, There's you lose too a point many. There's way too many. There's well, a huge even table if you just put stuff. two or three, and yeah. then put an ellipses after, you know, like things like this affect psyche. That might make sure people use that system because I think that's a really good way in in your game to keep track of your character's growth or uh, what's the degeneration. Um, degeneration, <laughs> and and stuff like that. I think it almost encourages, in a weird way, the player to take risks because you know, all right, I'm going to go ahead and, and finish this person off. I'm going to actually kill them in the game. But I can always 
do something to kind of regain that back, and that might be a journey to go from, oh my god, I just killed that person, all the party members, it's okay, it was a zombie, but it was a person. That conversation is spurred on, that causes growth, that keeps things fresh. Um, I, I like the system. I think it's cool to remind people, like, hey, use it, it's in the game. This, this might go to kind of a dark place, but I can't help but wonder if you've already killed, like, 30 people as, like, starting off as a normal person who's never killed anyone, you killed 30 people over the course of a game. Is number 31 really going to be that big of a deal? Mm. <laughs> like, at what point are you, you know, just kind of another notch on the belt? Yeah, at, at what point does it become, um, like, M. Bison's line from the Street Fighter movie of, uh, the day I came to your village was the most important day in your life, but for me it was a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. So Kyle, you were hitting on um, it's what what point did you start to talk uh, about? taking taking risks as a character? Yeah. It's not always uh, to kill or not to kill. That's a big one, um, or maybe even to to engage in combat or not to engage in combat. That's obviously also a risk. But you know, I know my character is not good at um, intimidating, but I'm going to give it a shot. You know that that sort of stuff can spur on character growth. Another thing is if you really are getting tired of your character in a campaign, it is entirely okay to bring in a new character. That was kind of forced upon Katie's uh, characters in our Abana game where he had a character die. Well, it was an in-character choice to have his to allow his character to die at that point in, in the campaign. It was like maybe what like 60% of the way through the campaign that his that Magnus died, and then he Sounds brought in right. Ingwe, and that was a really strong injection of some fresh, fresh ideas, fresh perspective that really the campaign needed at that point. Because in a lot of ways, the char- the characters that everybody were playing were really established at that point, and bringing in this new character who, on paper, had a lot of the same attributes as his previous character, but in personality was com- played a completely different way. That's the thing I was impressed by. If, if you looked at the two character sheets side by side, yeah, they'd be like 90% the same build, but totally different guys. Yeah. Good on you, Katie. Yeah. Even if the risk you take doesn't turn out the way you wanted, um, in Katie's case, he did want his character to, to die. He chose that. Um, but if you take a risk and it results in a character death, a lot of times that will be just the, the, the hot injection of fresh, young blood that you need to keep yourself from being all leathery and, and boring. And it doesn't have to be a character death that that causes that either. Um, it could simply be the character achieving their goal that they wanted, and so they don't have a reason to continue with the group anymore, and so they retire. Yeah. From our Planescape game that we've talked about before, um, I was willing to make a new character after um, I stuck to my scruples and chose the path of righteousness instead of murdering. <laughs> and But that, that character didn't want to roll with that group anymore, and I was happy to make another character to continue along. And in that case, you know, had we continued that game, I would have liked to have seen you know the DMs, Clayton... Uh, bring that character in as an NPC and, you know, have, like, have him murdered. <laughs> Which is probably what or, would have happened. would have been a quick fight. Mm. What would have been even better in that situation person I was... tripped with a cantrip. <laughs> what would have been even better is if that character had come back as an antagonist. Because that was a very good situation for that character to come back as an antagonist for the main group. Because... He had had this big falling out because of the the methods that the other players had chosen. He was powerful, had, handsome, well crafted. Well, he wasn't powerful yet. <laughs> wasn't particularly well crafted. <laughs> oh, but boy, howdy, was he handsome! Mm. <laughs> but in the system we were running, it it's not that expensive to buy a bunch of hired hands. Mm-hmm. So while he may not have been all that strong by himself, <laughs> he could have brought in brought in an army. Of stronger men. (laughs) (laughs) Point is, (laughs) taking risks with your character, even if it results in an in-game falling out of the party, out of game, that can be a really cool tool for the DM to use, which we're not on GM stuff yet, uh, but it's just a cool way to keep things fresh. I think it's Mm -hmm. a really good idea. 
I, I get really tired of, of um, games where no one takes any risks and it just ends up feeling like a like a weekend blockbuster, like a summer summer blockbuster movie where, of course, the good guys are going to win. Oh, 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 perfect. It ends up feeling like a superhero movie. Mm-hmm. Like, like, you know, oh, they're they're up against the guy. They can't beat the guy. Oh, wait, they beat the guy. Mm-hmm. Cred- yeah, credits they're... roll. After credits scene. Oh, there's there's Samuel L. Jackson. Okay. There's implications of another guy. On He's the way. coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can go ahead and... I think we've hit all the points that we had wanting to go over. Uh, oh, well, we, did, we didn't do we didn't do cousin Oliver. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> cousin Oliver, which was something that Jordan had awareness of, but we had to look up exactly the source of it uh, to explain the trope. It's originated with the Brady Bunch, where um, after so many seasons, the show was getting stale, so they brought in this cousin to live with the with live with the Bradys, and and well. Don't do. Don't follow the cousin Oliver um, <laughs> advice, because, uh, exactly as it has been portrayed in every other uh, like um, media, every sitcom that has brought in a character just to bring something new in. But it has it has worked well, um, bringing in new players, like just specifically bringing in a new player into the group can be a good way of, of, of bringing something new and fresh to the to a game. Like seven of nine. Yep. Yeah, great example, Seven of Nine. Bad example, Scrappy Doo. I hate that fucking seven dog. Nine. From Voyager? She didn't show up oh. for, like, what, season, like, five or six? Something like that. Pretty late. And at that point, that show was getting stale. It was stale from episode one. No, I think it's no. got about eight good episodes in season one. <laughs> they, it's all they, right. <laughs> they really, uh, I'll, I'll do two bad tropes from sitcoms here. They really jump the shark when they inject three Cousin Olivers in the final season when Seven of Nine gets some kids to hang out with her all the time. Oh, yeah. Remember that? <laughs> Awful. Can you also say bad Scrappy-Doo? Yeah. Do you have something specifically against Scrappy-Doo? Like, he's fucking annoying. <laughs> he's if, awful. If he had been made 20 years later and um, voiced by Joe Pesci, he would have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't. <laughs> That's um, such a good temporary point. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a friend visiting, uh, coming down, you know, a buddy's going to hang out with you. Um, one, get him playing games. Two, see if they want to come into your campaign as a guest character. Clear it with your GM first, or even just, no, actually, no. No, spring it on them, because mm-hmm. then they can't say, no, it's rude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really um, think it's rude anyway, <laughs> a lot of the time, but you know. Yeah, clear it with your GM, uh, you know, at least mention it. Um, your friend comes in, have them play for a session, they end up liking it, you know, they stick around, seven and nine, great introduction. They end up hating it. You murder him like that other. Was it a Happy Days character you said that just walks upstairs and well, never that was in the, that was in in the pilot planet. episode? Richie's oh. older brother, I don't remember his name, <laughs> said good night and went upstairs and was never, never heard from again. again. Yep. He's a corpse up there. Never yeah. heard from and never spoken of again. These happy days are yours and mine. He's just rotting through the floor. Yeah, between episodes, they just found him with a heroin needle in his arm. Like, <laughs> we'll never speak of it again. Okay. But, but whenever you bring in a new car- or a new player into an established game, there is a danger that the new player is just going to be overwhelmed by all of the in jokes and all the backstory that mm-hmm. they have no clue as to what has happened before. They have it's a tricky thing to pull off if you can pull it off right. Um, I know I've been in several, particularly online games, which is even harder to join in midstream. I've joined in a, in a few online games, I mean, not even that mid-campaign, like four or five sessions in, and I have no idea what's going on. Interaction with the other player characters is really forced because I've got all of these people that I'm not, I, I don't know. If it's somebody who is already a, an established friend of the group, it works a lot easier um, because then they just have to pick up on the end jokes and the backstory mm-hmm. of what is happening in game rather than all of the stuff that has happened with the group that every group has in jokes about in real life. There's also a lot of pressure on that new, that new character slash player because in 
to some degree, that episode's going to be about them. Yeah. They're the new weird thing happening to talk to and whatever. And God, how did I survive Hunter? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> how am I here? <laughs> if you're the GM running that for the new, um, the new player, give them something really important that will make the rest of the group love them, and then it'll probably all be fine. Mm-hmm. Moving on from that, we're, I think we're ready to move on specifically to talking about as from the Game Master's perspective. And if you are going to bring in somebody specifically for a one-shot, like a, a new a new player is either a new player or a player who has been with the group before and moved away, maybe they're back for just one night and they can join the campaign for one night, having them play that character. And then they're going back home, which is hours away, because they're an old friend in the group, their characters are more than likely going to really glom onto that character and really get, um, really like that character. That's a perfect opportunity to kill that character off in a horrific and gruesome and plot necessary way that then gets all of the players, all of the characters really invested in whatever plot is going on. And then you've got the players who who out of character want to avenge the death of their their friend's character. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Stranger Things, spoiler. Stranger Things, spoiler. Samwise fucking Gamgee! He, he comes in to Stranger Things, he's a great guy, he's got a video camera. Go with the kids. Go with the kids. No, he's not. He's good with the kids. Okay. He's good with the kids, he's a good guy. Uh, we, Go with we the kids. Did, we didn't watch he dies, people. and it's, it's, you knew it, you knew it was gonna happen, but it was still just like, oh no. Okay, they spent like episodes. Not Fox, mom, I feel so bad for her. They spent episodes making fun of him, and they had to be convinced to like give him a shot. Like, I don't think he was good with the kids necessarily. He, he was really nice to the kids. What you- nice does not equal good with kids, though. <laughs> I'm a nice guy. I'm not good around kids. Well, my opinion is that I'm a nice guy. Kids are little shits, let's be honest. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Um, I love kids. I'm I'm apparently the only one here. (laughs) End of Stranger Things. Spoilers. Going back to killing people. Yeah. (laughs) Let's do that. Um, You can't... I mean, it's not just new, new people who have just been brought in for the sole purpose of the Game Master killing them off. You can all. One thing I love to do whenever I finally have to do it to uh, inject interest in the game is oh, crap. What? What are? What? There was an author, Stephen King, said to kill your favorite character. He did that in The Stand. Halfway through the book, the game, the the novel was stagnating. He had no idea where to go with it, so he killed off who he had set up as the main character for the book, and he still had the second half of the book to write. Stan, spoiler alert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the the book was written like 35 years ago, <laughs> or came out. No, it was probably closer to 40 years now. <laughs> Belated spoiler for a book that came out <laughs> 35 to 40 years ago. But yeah, it's a great way to motivate a party that is not motivated. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to make a villain into a real sack of shit that is hated on a personal level, yes, oh, and some groups will look at like villains that are presented and be like, oh, "That's not really my problem." Hang on, um, I said the game master kills off their favorite NPC. Sometimes that is the villain. Oh, that I see. really throws the players for a loop. Whenever they're going along, they're they're completing their quest to defeat this bad guy, and then some suddenly somebody else comes in and steals their thunder. And reveals that off camera that the the main character dies. Players don't know how to handle that. Mm-hmm. It's a scramble to figure out what in the hell we're going to do. Yeah. When the focus of all of their efforts has suddenly been removed. My first instinct would be the villain faked their own death and this <laughs> is all a plot. <laughs> that is a possibility. Obi Wan taught me there's always a bigger fish. Unfortunately, you don't do what um want to say starting with Final Fantasy IX and several of them since have done in that you fight the final bad guy, they die, and then suddenly it is revealed that there is an even worse bad guy that you finally have to fight in the real final fight of the game. (laughs) I don't think we should be looking at Final Fantasy for uh, deep, deep advice uh, for storytelling. I'm trying to keep something fresh. Yeah, no, no, no. 
So speaking of Final Fantasy... <laughs> it's actually quite good at it. <laughs> oh, wait, before we move on to that topic, this might go without saying, but don't decide as a GM to just kill off one of your player characters, thinking it will freshen things up, like get it in your head that no matter what this person does, I'm going to kill their character, and it'll be fine, they'll make a new one. That That's not good. Don't do that. That's going to piss people off. It's not going to freshen things up at all. It's going to add like a fart to the room instead of some Febreze. However, I, as an addendum, I think it's perfectly fine to let a character die if shit's gone down and the dice are just bad or whatever, because afterwards people are going to remember that more than the 50 oh, times oh. that you know they succeeded. Oh, yeah. Um, if if it's a fair and legitimate mishap, fine. I, I think go for it. You know, don't don't pussyfoot around it. Take the risk. Have the character die. Especially if it's at a significant point. Like, you know, it would suck if, you know, your character just got killed by some random road bandits or something. But if it's in, like, a significant, you know, battle or whatever, that's a perfectly legitimate time to let somebody die. Yeah. The dice are the great deciders, and they don't, they don't follow the rules of... Uh, the rules of dramatic effect and have the player characters, um, when they're down on their ropes, you know, or mixing all my metaphors here, <laughs> whenever they're, um, they're against the ropes, the, the dice don't allow the player characters to suddenly have a second win and come back and beat Apollo Creed. It's kind of on the DM to, you know, they're the ones who decide when the lethal rolls are called for. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But I don't make a save or die yeah. roll on the trip between towns. Mm -hmm. But on the topic of killing off player characters, there are some players who, if the game master comes to you and says, "Hey, what if your character died?" There are some players who absolutely would love that, and they would absolutely run with it. So that's just another potential tool in the toolbox that um, don't just force a character to die. But that's a definitely a conversation that you can have if you think that one of the players would be good with it. Just find the most dramatic player in your group and ask them, because, like, I know the Kyles and also me would love that <laughs> any time it was brought up. I would like to say, just to, to beat on this for a little bit longer, um, this is one of the reasons why I think that Eclipse Phase sucks as a campaign setting, because all of the shit we've just been talking about is completely irrelevant in a game where everybody has infinite lives. Yep. I think you can make it relevant, but it takes you bending that system to your will. Like a horse, you know? You can't just jump on a horse and ride it. You gotta train, you gotta, you gotta break that horse. <laughs> Close face is a horse. And I broke it. <laughs> you have broken the literary device of you... analogy. It's gone, it's useless now. <laughs> Kyle, the only thing you have broken is our will. For Eclipse Face. <laughs> uh, friends are like horses, you know? You can't just get on one and ride it. you got to break it. <laughs> and speaking of transportation... <laughs> oh, man. That was so good. Uh, yeah. Uh, bringing in some new element of transportation could be a very cool idea, whether it's legitimately, oh, crap, our party has a horse now, or enough horses to carry all of the party maybe is a better idea. Could be you get a ship. Could be you get an airship. There's some Final Fantasy for you. Something they do right. It opens up the world. It allows your characters to explore farther, but also go to places they never thought they'd get to go to. You know, it's like that small town farm boy going out to L.A. The big, the big cherry. What do they call it? City of Angels. There it is. There it is. <laughs> it's, literally, it's literally the name, Los Angeles. That means angle. It means. The angles, because of all the stuff, because of all the buildings, they're transportation. Um, hard to do in a city because they're subways. Can't cut your players off from those, can you? So opening up new places isn't just something that can be done with transportation. Um, Jordan, your advice um, at the very beginning of um, giving them some new option, like something that I've done, is. The players have been in dungeon crawl after dungeon crawl, and they've been traversing the wilderness. They get back to big, what is essentially to a home base, and they meet with the king, and suddenly they are invited to a masquerade ball. Mm -hmm. The ranger and the druid and all of these wilderness um, types, the barbarian, are now 
have to be uh, pushed into a court intrigue adventure. It's a social mobility instead yeah. of just geographic mobility. That's the least as disorienting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ooh, what about psychic mobility? Introduce some, like, uh, more cyberpunk, I guess, but you could even do it in a fantasy setting. Um, like a, a session of your campaign where it's some sort of dream sequence or, um, like, you know, some either neutral force or big bad has, like, put your party into some kind of coma trance and there's, like, things are familiar but strange and the players have to figure out a way to break out of that mind spell. That was a thing in the, uh, in the Elric uh, Young Kingdom stuff. Like, they had sort of this dream realm as, you know, kind of an astral plane <laughs> kind of thing. And you could take certain drugs or use certain items or whatever and go on an adventure in the dream realm. And it was very Inception-like, but years before that movie came out. And um, there were, like, certain artifacts and things like that that existed in there and that people would have sort of in their consciousness and it would, you know, do things for them. But you could go into their dreams, steal that, and, like, there were dream thieves running around stealing these bits of, you know, magic that existed in people's minds. Um, and then, you know, you'd wake up in the same bed that you laid down in after the adventure was over. Something that I haven't, that didn't get a lot of book space, but that was an interest, introduced in the Eberron campaign setting was basically this shared collective unconsciousness that permeated the world. Whenever people went to sleep, they basically went off into this dream realm, mm-hmm. and pretty much everybody had some sort of connection to it. I, I always loved exploring that as, like you said, having these weird, taken from like psychedelic imagery and just putting the players in something that is completely alien, completely mm-hmm. foreign. There's no frame of reference for the things that they're encountering. Mm-hmm. Another thing that, uh, as far as geography, that the um, transportation stuff does, that Final Fantasy does really well, is it changes the challenge level of things. It allows you to skip over the the redundant shit of walking from point A to point B and all the stupid low-level encounters along the way, and it gives you access back to those points if you want to go back to you know the first starting area, but then it also opens up all these other things as well. So it's a convenience thing for players as much as it is a broadening of possibility for storytelling. Um, I've been playing Final Fantasy, and it's awesome to just be able to hop back to an original spot when before it was like, do I really want to spend an hour walking to this other side of the continent? And it's also a very good threshold of right here is where we're changing the scope of the game. Mm -hmm. I think you can also do that with more or different responsibilities for your players. And it doesn't have to be that natural progression of you know, wandering soldier in service of a powerful person does a good job, now receives a fiefdom. Now the game becomes, like, marriage farming and child-rearing simulator. Doesn't have to be that. Though, that could be cool. But, uh, you know, even if your your um, party gets an artifact that they have to keep with them and uh, take care of it, and the artifact gives them some cool new skills, they can do things with the artifact. But there's also... A group of shadow assassins trying to take the artifact. You know, that's a new responsibility. You gotta watch after that thing. You know, like Kanye said, great. Now I gotta be responsible for this water bottle. So, responsibilities. Um, I can't be the only one with some really coherent thoughts on that. Along with interesting items, um, as you, well, in a typical D&D game, as you get, get higher and higher in level, you have you start getting access to like artifacts. You start having access to intelligent items, um, things that will talk to you, like a cloak or a sword or a shield that will have a folk on conversation with you. And if depending on which one you have, you might have one that is trying to seduce you over to evil, and you are cursed to carry. Or something that is, you know, a legendary item that people will recognize on site, and that's like. You know, a, a thing that is known to exist. The holy fuck, you're the guy that's got that thing. Whatever, that 
would draw a ton of attention and be a huge problem as much as it is a benefit. What sucks is every level get uh, the next plus one increment thing. Mm -hmm. That's lame. Yeah, the item has to be special. Either special in what it can do or the special, like you said, in the fact that other people recognize it, that people have a reaction to that specific item Mm -hmm. is now something that you've got to deal with. Um, Or it might just be that um, suddenly everybody is gunning for you now because you have this item. Mm -hmm. Like uh, The syndrome that Gene Wilder's character from Blazing Saddles where he uh, was seeing like everybody was coming at him and he finally saw this heard a kid heard a voice say draw he turned around it was an eight year old kid well bastard shot him in the ass <laughs> <laughs> um, even knowledge is responsibility um, your party's hanging out with a, um, a prince the guy dies it's NPC and your party's pretty sure they can, you know, not get blamed for it, but they now have the knowledge that that prince, who was perhaps next in line for some responsibility, is dead. How do they handle that? Do they go and, and tell the person, yeah, this person died in battle, they were very valiant, we're so sorry for your loss, maybe they get locked up, maybe they get thanked, do they just let him... Stark's burden. Yeah. You know, do they let him die there in the mud and not say a damn thing? Do they try and milk that for some kind of profit somehow, you know, take the dude's royal sigil... Knowledge is power. If you give people like a like a castle or whatever, some kind of responsibility given to them by the <clears throat> by the king or whatever, once you're kind of late in the game, like that, level nine, whatever. <laughs> that's that's in old D anD D. That's the level that yeah. knights got castles. That's um just automatically. You got to keep it level nine, and <laughs> and a wizard got a tower. Yeah. Where'd they come from? Oh. And the and the rogue got their thieves guild. And I don't remember what the rest of the people got. The, the um, cleric got their monastery. Huh. But once, you, once you've once you got something like that for the, the player to consider, that's a way for the DM to fuck with the player that's not just the, you know, basic attack you from the darkness, whatever kind of thing. Um, I don't know. It's, it's cool. You know, high-level cleric, a bunch of my, you know, Acolytes just got kidnapped and they're going to be sacrificed or whatever. That's nothing on you. I mean, at that point, a player's rolls are probably sufficient. Like, their stats are sufficient to keep most, like, surprise attacks from really being a big deal. But that doesn't mean that everybody around you is as competent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dealing with the all the things that power brings. Something that, you, well, was implied in what you were touching on. <clears throat> um, having all of these underlings... Like if you have if you have the keep and you've got people underneath of you, that would be a good opportunity. Like if particularly if one of the other players in the group wants to run a one shot, like in the campaign world, they could totally run a game where it's suddenly, okay, you're all playing the the um, the squires of the player characters, or you're playing um, the, um, the 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 city watch. For the player characters, you've got to do this adventure that is way below the even notice of the regular player characters because it's such a trivial thing that they can't be bothered with it because they're dealing with world-ending events. That would be so fun. <laughs> Playing the, the snot-nosed little squire of some other player's character. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That'd be great. Can we please do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the next time we were on a camp- long campaign, somebody else can take over for a session and run something like that. (laughs) I think doing a one-shot like that in the middle of a campaign wouldn't necessarily have to be something based in that actual setting, though that's a really cool idea. Um, Even just doing something completely different. And if you're the GM, if you're not burned out, if you're still going strong, I guess you could run it, but um, I think giving that opportunity to another player, have them run something for one session, have a bottle of wine... You deserve it. Kick back, have somebody rub your feet, you know, <laughs> get some, like, smoked Gouda, oh, and just enjoy that one shot. Come back to it fresh the next week. Another interesting twist on this, I think, would be if you had people play <clears throat> an antagonist group, mm-hmm. opposing their actual characters in some indirect kind of way. I think that would be fun. It's definitely fun if um, the other group is then later encountered in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, e- whether they are 
full on antagonist, or maybe they just have to go to that part of the world and they have to talk with them and convince them to get the item back, knowing that most players will make characters who are completely obstinate and will not, on pain of death, would not give up an item that they have worked hard for, <laughs> knowing then that the player characters have to come in and then get that item from them. <laughs> be cool. So, um, in any campaign, as you continue on and on and on, especially in a campaign that really has no set ending you're going to be picking up plot threads that are just left left loose hanging if you want to start bringing some um bringing something new into the game you don't necessarily have to bring in something that is completely new to the characters bringing in something new might just be bringing in a conclusion because it's particularly in uh, in open ending games there really isn't... It, it seems like there's just nothing but the accumulation of things. There's the accumulation mm-hmm. of experience points. There's the accumulation of items. There's the accumulation of NPCs. There's the accumulation of quests. And not all of these get resolved. And it does bring some freshness into a game when there is a sense of accomplishment that we actually did finish something. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something big. It could be a player was flirting with an NPC early on in the game. Well, maybe that character comes back and actually becomes a love interest. Or um, the players... I'm going to have to have ask everyone to use your imaginations for a second. What? May, maybe the player characters decide not to kill somebody. Why? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm wanting you to lose, use your imagination. <laughs> and that person can come back and... Maybe not necessarily be a, uh, an antagonist. Maybe now that they recognize they were spared once, maybe they have the upper hand, and maybe now they're one of the big bad guys' lieutenants. They thoroughly beat the their they had the player characters in a pretty much unwinnable situation, and then the this person who they w- once spared allows them to live, just knocks them out. That'd be a hell of a thing. And then takes all of their equipment so that then all the player characters have to go through that rigmar- rigmarole of reestablishing all of their stuff. And draws a dick on their forehead. Yep. How would you concoct that situation? You just have to have a lot of a lot of enemies <laughs> that were under the control of that one person. Yeah. And so many that the player characters just could not fight. That's the only situation that I can conceive of where player characters would give up without dying. I guess if there's some other thing they have to go do, if, you know, somebody you love is, like, strapped to a time bomb or something, you just don't have time to fuck around with whatever's happening, some kind of distraction, I don't know. That'd be tough to put together. Might work. Thinking about it, I don't think it would work. Just because player characters will always think of something. Hmm. They're always... Player characters are so goddamn in, um, ingenuity. Have such ingenious? goddamn... Yeah, they're so ingenious that they're gonna... Tr- they're gonna think of some way around it. Some way around the the plot that the, the Game Master thinks that they've got this airtight yeah. um, box that they've got them in. I don't know. If there's... If there's magic or, like, high-tech stuff, then maybe you could work out some kind of escape or something. But, yeah, just for them to to have a, a demonstrated bad guy at their mercy and then them not kill it, oh, man, that'd be tough. Like, even if there was, like, a plot thing where most of the group is convinced we should let this guy live for X, Y, and Z, there's going to be some dickhead that's like, no, we can't let him live, pal. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> there's always that fucker. Half the time it's me. <laughs> so, I don't know. I like the idea that it's worth a try. There's a wacky idea. Um, unrelated to injecting the plot with interesting things or the actual nitty-gritty of running your game, um, using different... Bells and whistles, you know, uh, media in your campaign. Um, the introduction of some props, toys, and candles to the bedroom could be very fun. Some music. 
Yeah, a little bit of music. Um, I mean, but really, you know, uh, maybe you've been using a battle mat, and you're like eight sessions in. Don't use the battle mat for a little while. See if that mixes things up. Um, or if you haven't been using one, bring the battle mat in for this like really cool, you know, like Battle of the Blackwater style, like huge uh, event that's about to happen. Uh, move to the living room, uh, pull up some photos or like um, like a, a looped rain gif. Um, gif? I say gif. <laughs> no, you just said gif, so yeah, that's, so... that is the correct way. So no, continue. It's, no, it's false. Um, it's GIF. canon now, Kyle Perkins. Pull up a looped GIF. rain gif on your computer. Um, or if you're not into using a gif, you could use a webum. Um, that's a better version of a gif. <laughs> he says... Um, <laughs> um, do what me and Mean do sometimes, or you just show up in some type of costume. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, br- bring things in, um, uh, uh, what, what is that? Um, I usually do it, uh, not that we've done it in a little while, but with board games, I've got this really cool, ridiculous fucking, um, cup. It's not the cup of a carpenter. It is this very fancy, like, glass and wood and, like, it's a, it's a goblet. It's a goblet. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a, I was going for the word. Um, oh, chalice. Oh, even better. They call it the chalice. You're saying you and chose poorly. <clears throat> I chose poorly, but look at me. I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, my life's fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, for board games, um, we usually pick a chalice game. The, um, you know, the winner of the chalice game um, gets to drink out of the chalice the next time we play board games. Haven't done that tradition in a while, but I still really like it. You could do something similar with your sessions. You know, be like, hey, at the end of the session, um, we're all going to nominate people for, like, something really cool they did or, you know, just um, outstanding player moment. And the winner of that gets to use this awesome chalice the next time we play. Um, I like the mini game stuff from Abena, like the uh, the mass combat rules and that kind of stuff, like where the, the actual rules of the game are changing for the evening because you're just doing something on a completely different scale. We're still playing the same campaign. But the mechanics are very, very different. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there was a, uh, there was some pirate campaign for fifth edition that one of my friends was telling me about where, um, you take over a pirate ship and then you become a pirate. And there's this whole mini game where they, they don't necessarily make you act out every single boarding and taking of the ship or whatever, but it becomes its own little thing that you play through to see how well you do for six months on the high seas or whatever. Um, that kind of stuff is neat. Also, like, if uh, if you're doing something in the game, like, um, there's rules online for uh, Sabic, the Star Wars card game. So if you're in, like, a cantina for a session or whatever, you could fucking have everybody play a damn game of Sabic to get in with a crime boss or whatever the hell you want to do. Mm-hmm. I like that idea. In um, the Adventure Zone, this um, actual play I listen to... <laughs> Um, they, for one arc, they had to get through a hundred years, like, just to, to tell the stories of the story of this hundred years very quickly. And, um, to do that, they just used a different system. They just put their characters in a, in a new system for this arc and then went back to it after those hundred years, which I thought was really interesting and fun to listen to. I'm confused about something, though. My hat was making a rattling noise. I still don't know what it is. Hats don't normally make noises. <laughs> I don't normally <laughs> wear hats. <laughs> But that's a great thing to bring to a campaign. I am building, inspired by our good buddy Kenny, who's been on the podcast, I am building a collection of wacky hats. So, you know, it spices things up. You know, you put Costumes, on, like I said. Yeah, you, you put on a hat, do a different voice. We're talking about RPGs. Let's go. <laughs> Are we? Are we? Yes. Let's go ahead and go into uh, interesting geek stuff. I'll go ahead and start. Because a couple of days ago, it was confirmed that liquid salt water was found on Mars. A saltwater lake about uh, 12 miles in diameter was under the is un, is currently under the Martian polar ice cap. Glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mars Express. You've been up there a long time. It's like a 15 year thing in the making. Super cool. That's all I got. Um, I mentioned it earlier in the podcast, and I don't think I've mentioned it before, but the and Haley might have. So stop me, she has the quiet year. Did she ever recommend oh, that? Oh, yeah, Haley did. So. Oh, cool. Well, she, yeah, <clears throat> I love that game. It's a great game. I've um, been playing a brand new game recently. Um, it's called Super Mario Brothers 3. It's so good. It came out in 1988. It's my favorite game ever. been playing it with my brother. 
It's awesome. There's secrets. If you haven't played that game, check it out. It's been too long. You, you should have played it by now. Play, al- play it more. And there's also a movie that tied into the release of that. Uh, yeah, man. Say, it sounds like it's worthy of at least two Bob Hoskins, films. John Leguizamo. <laughs> no, I was talking of The Wizard. That's the one I was thinking. Oh, what the, mm, the power glove. I was talking yeah. about the, the Mario Brothers movie. <laughs> <laughs> Also, it's so cool where they stop at the gas station and the kid jumps out and plugs his Nintendo into the shitty gas station TV to play for a minute. God. <laughs> the 80s. <laughs> uh, I got two geek things, I guess. Um, one is entertainment and one is science. You reminded me of it with the Mars thing. Um, I guess a 42,000 year old nematode worm was just oh, thawed heard. alive from Siberia. Yep. What oh could go God. wrong? <laughs> Talk about a feature film. Um, <laughs> Yikes. So, yeah, it's wiggling around after 42 millennia of life on this earth. You know what? Earth. I don't think that Jurassic Park would be as scary with just a bunch of nematodes. I'm just going to throw that one out No, there. but the thing is as scary. Until <laughs> <laughs> it like, burrows its way into your sphincter. Yeah. You've been thinking a lot about sphincters during this, yeah. this, this podcast. They're in my brain constantly. The other thing is a uh, new show on Netflix called Dark Tourist. I watched an episode last night where the guy goes to New Orleans and finds quote-unquote real vampires and hangs out with these people who've got these very psychologically unhealthy relationships in which they prick each other and drink their blood. And it's very, very weird. He also hangs out with a... Uh, ex hitman who's still kind of way into being a hitman. That one was odd. KD um, was telling me about one where he hangs out with some World War II reenactors. I haven't got and to that one. Yet. There are some guys who um, wear uh, German uniforms, you know, Wehrmacht, but then you'll also get a few dudes will show up in like SS gear mm-hmm. and just be like, now they, they were bad dudes. Like, they were bad dudes. We do not <laughs> like them, but man, I fucking love these skulls. I look good in skulls. There was a there was also a guy in Dallas who does uh, tourist reenactments of the Kennedy assassination in these like crazy golf carts. Yes, <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> what golf carts with like big bullhorns on the front? Uh huh. Uh, yeah, drives around like thumping bass music and stuff. And talking, to, he's got like a he's got like a Jackie reenactor sitting there looking sad while they're like playing hip hop, driving around you know downtown Dallas. Huh. It's weird. <laughs> That's a, I gotta check that out. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, Dark Tourist. Hmm. Alright, guys. Why well, you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice? Do we have dice? No. no. I got it. No. Unconvinced. That was just water in a Powerade bottle. <laughs> <laughs> but you thought it was dice. <laughs> you sucker. <laughs> This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.